I hadn't been to see Dame Myra Hess since she last moved house in London, and I was surprised to find how rural and quiet the new setting was. It's a cul-de-sac with a road not made up yet, an old house with big trees, birds, and the lulling sound of bat and ball. She lives just behind Lord's cricket ground. She was terrified of the microphone, so we chatted about old times. I didn't quite like to tell her that the first promenade concert I ever attended as a child was graced by her as soloist, but I did ask her if she remembered when she first played at the proms. Well, it was uh, quite early in my career and, of course, a great event. It wasn't the first time you played with Henry Wood, though, was it? Oh, yes. yes. It was? Yes, I think it was. Yes. I believe I played the Liszt E flat concerto at my yes. first promenade concert. What was it like? Was he really as brisk and businesslike? As oh, he was wonderful. Mm. He was so helpful and friendly. And of course, I played with him many, many, many countless times after that. But his his kindness and generosity. I remember one performance of the uh, Mozart D minor concerto. I took a wrong turning, and I was still very young. And I thought, oh, this is the end of my career. He'll never engage me again. And uh, when we came off platform, I said, apologize profoundly. She said, oh, why, that's nothing, he said. You might have gone into the wrong movement. Then we'd have had some fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten that. Yes, here we are. I played the E-flat concerto, my debut. Dare I ask what year? 1908. I had the large fee of three guineas. My goodness. <laughs> Scarcely seems credible. Three guineas. Three I remember goodness. the first time I had five guineas for a concert. I was terribly thrilled. My mother used to keep a book with my expenses and fees and so forth. Sometimes I was ten and six to the good. <laughs> <laughs> May I change the subject a little and ask you about Beecham? What was he like to work with in the in when he was a young? Impossible. Man? <laughs> <laughs> Enthusiastic. Work? Impossible. Uh, impossible because you never knew when you were going to get a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I remember my dear old uh, professor. He wrote me a postcard. Said, "Who is this fellow Beecham?" If he doesn't conduct well, I shall conduct for you. But it was this uh, terrible uncertainty uh, of rehearsal. Mm. But I, I always loved working with him from a musical point of view. But he was a uh, fanatic, of course. Mm. And then, of course, he was terribly naughty, always conducting without his music when he didn't always know it. Mm. Do you remember the first concerto that you ever played then with, with Beecham? What was it? I played um, Beethoven IV, mm -hmm. and in those days I had the audacity to play my own cadenzas, Did which you? have long ago been destroyed and burnt. Have you barely waiting. destroyed your own? If oh, you, heavens, If you yes. looked at them now, what, what would you find they were like? I should probably be very, very ill. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, can, I have a visual memory of masses and masses of arpeggios and most... Terrible modulations, very no. long, of course. Do you think your style of playing Mozart has changed in the years? Of Mozart? Mm. Well, I hope so. <laughs> 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 I hope so. And every time I study a Mozart concerto, it's new. And you play the, the whole lot fairly regularly, yes. do you? Well, I have played the whole series, you know, twice. Uh, the National Gallery, we played the whole series. Must be very few pianists who play them all, aren't there? I think only a few. Mm. Do you approve of anybody else's Mozart? Oh, that's a terrible question. <laughs> Don't give us oh, a terrible I answer. I have enjoyed other people's Mozart, certainly. Oh, but it, yes. Don't you find as a composer one really dislikes more people playing than any other composer? Well, I think it's um, more often played badly than almost any other composer. W why, do you think? Because it lacks spontaneity, I would say, and that if Mozart isn't spontaneous, it's dead. Mm. And the public doesn't have a chance to realize the endless inspiration 
but it must be spontaneous. a little bit the history of the National Gallery. How, how did it start? Do you remember? We started a few weeks after the war, October the 10th, 1939. Oh, right away, I didn't realize yes, that. Yes, yes. And I, ha I happened to mention casually to some friends it would be rather nice to try and have some lunchtime concerts because nothing was going on and the blackout you know, made it so difficult for people to get home. And to cut a very long story short, Sir Kenneth Clark, who was then the director, said he loved the idea. And so it was decided to open the gallery. It had been closed, of course, all the pictures gone. And it was decided that we should have uh, every day, five days a week, at lunchtime. And uh, I gave the first recital and thought perhaps 40 or 50 of my friends would turn up. And at 10 minutes to one, the concerts are from one to two. At ten minutes to one, Sir Kenneth Clark came in and said there are a thousand people on the pavement, which was terribly exciting because the BBC had announced it just the three days before. A great many of them sat on the floor, so we hadn't enough chairs. And we hadn't any change because we hadn't any money. We had to <laughs> send one of the gallery attendants rushing off to the bank to get some money. And so they started. And so they went on for six and a half years. Interrupted from time to time by... No, never interrupted. But what, what about the bombs? Never in interrupted. In the bombs, we went down, we had a small shelter room, at least we called it a shelter room. But it was then we, we got into financial difficulties, of course, because we had to have smaller audiences. But it was then that um, we should never have been able to carry on if it hadn't been for America and Canada. They started funds for us, and contributions came from great artists such as Toscanini, Rachmaninoff, Kusubitsky, many, many others, groups of students, music clubs, colleges and individuals. All over the continent we were able to carry on without a break. They sent us thousands of dollars. How many concerts were there altogether? Do you, know, do you actually know? There were 1,968 concerts and attended by 824,152. And although we gave 23,000 in fees, everybody received five guineas whether it was Mozevich or a young beginner, mm. everybody had just had a, an expense fee of five guineas. Of course, it was enormously interesting to play so much chamber music. Yes. I know I used to tell the audience that I'd never played so much and practiced so little. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you accompanying Elena Gerhardt. Ah, that yes. Marvelous. That was one of my great experiences giving concerts with her, mm. and I'm sure that she's the greatest leader singer of our time. Mm. And it was a very touching story because we were to give a concert the day we heard that the Germans had, had gone and attacked Holland, and she telephoned me in the morning and she said, Myra, I cannot sing today. Nobody will want to hear the German language. 
and I assured her, and finally reassured her, that she was so beloved that it wouldn't make any difference at all. And finally she said she would sing. And we went in together, and she was very white and nervous. But I think the audience sensed that she might be a little self-conscious. She had such an ovation that it was quite a few minutes before she could begin singing. Mm. In the First World War, we weren't allowed to mention a German word. Songs had to be sung in English. And Schumann's Warum was called Pourquoi? <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. But it was a nice proof that in this war, the music and the words that were written for the music were more important. Mm. You spent a great deal of your life, almost as much time in England as, uh, as in America, haven't you? Yes, second home divided, yes, but I've been to America, well, 40 times. 40 times? Yes. And you've lived there for great stretches. You, you feel I've always been there for three or four months at a time. Mm. And Find the American people especially sympathetic? Enormously. Stimulating. Somebody asked me once in America, how would you describe the difference between an American audience New York audience and a London audience. And I said, well, being British, I can only talk from a personal point of view. But I said, when I go onto the platform in London, I feel that everybody hopes I will do my best. When I come onto the platform in New York, I feel everybody expects me to do my best. And it's just that added stimulation Probably because one's always more self-conscious in one's own country. Mm. Do you think students have an easier time of it today, on the whole, with their, all the money and grants they get? Yes and no. Yes, because perhaps more is done for them, and then broadcasting is a great help. But also, the, 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 when I, the, the no is the terrible competition. There are too many people now who are not necessarily great musicians, but who can, for instance, play the piano. Mm, they can In all some instances, them. much too well. <laughs> <laughs> much too well and much too fast. Okay. In fact, one day, when these young people take these exaggerated tempi, I'm going to get up in the audience and I'm going to say, Vive le sport! <laughs> I tell them it is when I'm teaching and they play so ridiculously fast. I say, it isn't music anymore. I just as soon watch uh, skating. you have rather given up playing contemporary music. Why? Why well, I don't play much contemporary music now. In those days, it was more romantic and melodic. And now composers use the piano mainly as a percussive instrument. Tink bonk is what I call it. <laughs> And this percussive business this is something I've spent my life trying to avoid. To me, music should sing. And if it does not sing, it eventually makes one or makes me cross and irritable. Do you actually like recording? Hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I hate all machines. Uh, I hate this microphone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I told you when you asked me if I would do it. I said I would feel as if I were going to be photographed. And the photographer asked me to smile, and I couldn't remember where my mouth was. <laughs> and I feel uncomfortable about recording, too. Although nowadays it isn't quite as formidable as it used to be, when one split second caused one to repeat an entire work. But I hate machines. And I try never to judge a performance finally, even when it's broadcast. There's always that between the listener and the player, some mechanical device. Mm. But do you hate your own records? Yes. All of them? Well, isn't, the, isn't the one of them that, that, that you think is really...? Occasionally, if I hear one by chance, I think, well, it isn't too bad. Bits of the carnival and 
Beethoven 109. So you'd really like to record everything you've recorded all over again? Oh, yes, definitely. And the Valz Noble from Carnival brings to an end this edition of Talking About Music. This is John Amis saying goodbye from London.